The first Data Futurology event for next year is going to be Ops World, data-centric operations for business value. We're going to be hosting the community in person at the Sofitel Wentworth in Sydney on March 14th and 15th. We're going to be discussing operationalizing securely for business value, impact and scale. What are we operationalizing? Everything across the data analytics and AI space. We're bringing all the ops perspectives together into this one event. So it's going to be data ops, operationalizing data pipelines, analytics ops, operationalizing our analytics, MLOps and AI ops about operationalizing machine learning and artificial intelligence in our businesses. We're going to be discussing processes, frameworks, the observability and the future of this space. Check out the website for more and hope to see you there. I'd like to say a big thank you to our sponsors, Talent Insights. Talent Insights are Australia's leading specialist data recruitment business. With offices in Sydney, Melbourne, and Brisbane, they're experts at providing recruitment strategy and building data teams for clients across industries Australia-wide. They provide recruitment solutions for all roles across the data lifecycle, including data engineering, data science, advanced analytics, customer and marketing insights, business intelligence, data product managers, and data governance. They're skilled at finding the best permanent and contract hires for your business needs, as well as statement of work, project focus, data resources. At Talent Insights, relationships matter most. I can say from first-hand experience, Talent Insights are fantastic to work with. Whether you're a business leader within an HR network or a specialist data candidate, Talent Insights should be the first company you turn to for all your data recruitment needs. Find them at talentinsights.com.au. Hi, this is Felipe Flores. Welcome to Data Futurology. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing um, careers, value of data science, proving that uh, to execs and a number of use cases across different industries. We have Anne Sebastian with us. She's the senior data scientist at West Farmers One Digital. And how are you going today? Fantastic. Thanks, Felipe, for having me. It's a great privilege. I've been on I had a listen of the podcast for quite some time, and it has enabled me to get a pulse check into the Australian data science industry while getting some jogging in. So it's super exciting to be here, and I'm hoping to share a different perspective from down in the trenches building data science products. I love it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for being here and for all your support and um, for coming into the, the conferences and always um, helping us uh, along with, with um, roundtables and things like that in the conferences. That's been fantastic. Uh, so thank you so much for that. So thank to, to kick fun. things off, uh, could you tell us a little bit about your um, your role and your, your remit um, and a, a little bit about the, the previous experiences that you had leading up to that? Yes. Uh, so uh, I fell into the data roles thrice in my career, spanning 17 years. The first two innings in data space were purely by accident, and the third foray into the data science was by design. So the first innings was where I was leading software engineers and consulting, and my manager said, hey, we've got this exciting project, Griffin. So why don't you learn all about data and uh, lead the project in a, in a month's time from Chicago? So Griffin is a mythical creature with eagle's head and lion's body. It turns out that Project Griffin is the data warehousing and reporting project for University of Chicago. So in two years, I learned deeply about data engineering and data visualization. The second innings was when I migrated to Australia in 2009. I applied for all roles that matched my experience, .NET, Java, and data. The immediate interview calls I got away from the data space. So the next few years, I worked across data visualization, data engineering, and data design. Then one day in mid-2013, I was in a happy place, and I, on my commute to work, I read an article about data science. It talked about how data science is a combination of maths, stats, um, programming, and data, how it's driving business decision, and how it's the sexiest job in 21st century. So by the time I reached office, I made the decision that this is precisely what I want to do. So in the next one year of mat leave, I spent um, my time juggling the challenge of taking care of the baby and upskilling myself in data science. On return to work, I started applying for roles. It took me a long time of nine months, 
But finally, I landed on an internal team with data science, data visualization, and a little bit of data engineering. That was the beginning of my third innings in data science. So I shadowed the senior data scientist in, on, the, on the team, learned the tricks of the trade, and then slowly moved across the different parts of the organization. So I worked as a data scientist across use cases in home lending, NPS analytics, complaints analytics, and the customer analytics. So some of the use cases that I worked on includes building discretionary pricing engine for home lending and rates negotiations, identifying the key factors influencing NPS scores through regression analysis and information value, uh, building the voice of customer dashboard for board customer committees across complaints, NPS verbatims, call center logs, and social media, and automating the classification of complaints. So after listening to a podcast episode where one of the retail leaders talked about their learning and development focus, it planted the seeds in my mind to check out the retail industry. So when an opportunity presented itself with Best Farmers, I was excited to learn about their vision and learning and development support they provided, and I pursued it further. So I took up the role of senior data scientist at Best Farmers in Jan this year. My current focus is on building data science products using shared data asset. So I love the third innings with data science even more than the other two innings. So for business teams, data science is at times like Griffey, the mythical creature. Um, so I love working with business teams, demystifying data science and achieving business benefits through data science. Amazing, amazing. What a journey. And <clears throat> yeah, I love that uh, you made the, the decision, you know, quickly, you were able to act on it, move forward, um, and you were patient with, you know, getting the the, the opportunities and, and mm. pivoting in your career, redirecting, but you were, you know, yeah. consistent um, and stay, staying the, the course. I love that. I love that perseverance and the commitment. That's outstanding. And um, tell me, looking back with all the use cases that you have worked on, what, what would be some of the ones that you're most proud of um, that you could tell us a little bit more detail about? Yeah, it's an incredible experience to be part of a journey, developing an idea through to proof of concept, through to productionization, uh, to a system that is adopted across the organization. The journey from idea to proof of concept to productionization is often a long one. So I am in the middle of such a journey now. I will talk through the last one I completed because business benefits and the impact are always the highlights of such stories. So I would like to highlight those. The use case that I'm most proud of that's completed is the automating the complaints classification, where we implemented various natural language processing models to predict the category of the complaints using real-time models. So I'll provide a bit of background context into the organizational setting and industry a backdrop, uh, which will lead to the business process before really delving into the application. So to set the background context, so many of the listeners from Australia will remember government established Royal Commission into banking, financial services, and superannuation in 2017. After that, the financial services firm that I was working on started listen, leaning more into the voice of the customer on systematically identifying the pain points of customers from complaints. So the firm formed a team of eight analysts to annotate the complaints in a standard and peer-reviewed way. The team of the analysts would categorize the complaint around details such as what caused the customer issue, when the complaint happened in the customer journey stage, the product associated with the complaint, the fee associated with the complaint. They also chose a unique complaint scenario. The team then validated these unique complaint scenarios with the business areas. So the analytics team worked with the risk teams to uh, assign ownership of these unique complaint scenarios into the business areas. The business teams then owned the fix of these uh, issues and the progress on fixing these issues were reported up to board customer committees. So a robust process to listen into the voice of customer and fix internal issues was established. So there was more demand from the specialized areas of the bank 
that were not part of the main complaints handling system. And the analyst team couldn't actually take on more classification work. So they were crunched for resources. So by the time we had a sizable corpus of classified complaints. So we all know how hard is it to get nicely annotated, peer-reviewed annotations in an organizational and business context. So the annotated corpus of hundreds of thousands of complaints were like a data scientist dream come true. So we began the journey to automate the annotations through the natural language processing models to solve for the resource crunch. So I initially worked with the complaints analytics team in building and operationalizing a couple of classification models on what we call the infrastructure on demand servers in our data center. So not cloud at that stage. So these were deployed as Python programs running on Windows server machines that kicks off at 5 a.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning, which outputs into a database, which then gets integrated with the tactical workflow that the annotating team had. As an organization, another backdrop story is we were bracing for further industry changes in complaints handling space. So soon after operationalizing these models, ASIC, which is the regulatory body, um, released a regulatory guide into internal dispute resolution across banking and financial services, formerly known as RG271. So it established a set of guidelines for complaints handling. RG271 also included a requirement for financial services firms to identify possible systemic issues from complaints. So the firm established a transformation program to roll out a new system altogether for handling the complaints end to end across all customer channels, such as you know, branches, call centers, uh, chat boards, and emails. With that came the opportunity to move the classification workflow into this new system and embed the classification models as a back-end process to this new system. So I worked on building and implementing real-time NLP models in our cloud environment that interfaces with the new complaints handling system via API calls. So I'll probably go into a bit, a bit more into how the application works so to give, give the listeners a feel um, into how it, it was actually deployed. So once the complaint reaches a particular stage in the workflow in the new complaints handling system, the system invokes um, a call to our model production environment via API. And the models provide a real-time response back. So all five classifications are done in one call and it's returned to the front-end system. So each of the models also provides an uncertainty measure for each categorization that indicates the model's lack of surety around predictions. So business team has the ability to configure an uncertainty threshold in the front-end application. So based on the threshold that is configured in the front-end application, the, the classifications that require review are passed on to the manual classification team. The, the system, the front end system and the back end system has got the ability to exclude a few complaints from this classification workflow. So these are then given to the analyst without any pre-filled categorization, which then helps for ground truth label gathering. Mm -hmm. And that then helps us for model retraining and model monitoring purposes. So that's really an end to end app application and how it evolved from an idea to proof of concept to a final production system that is adopted across the organization. So it, it's my favorite because of being part of that idea to proof of concept to productionization, being able to use real time uh, NLP and API calls um, and being able to enable the analyst team to take on more classification from the additional areas of the bank. So they were now able to come up with more annotating framework for really specialized areas of the bank that didn't fit into the 80%, 90% scenario across the organization. Amazing. Amazing. That is so good. Um, I have like so many questions. That is so interesting. Um, could you tell us more about the the start of the process? How was it? Um, how was it that 
the work went from from idea to the beginning of the technical work uh what was what was that that process like uh so i think at the beginning uh some there was some strategic discussion at the very high level on the strategy we want to proceed to even the resource crunch so and that spurred the uh, the idea of okay let's try to automate it but to be honest at that stage we didn't know where to start or which models to automate on uh, it was a big piece of unknown and i remember coming into office one really early like 6:30 in the morning one day and i sat down and i prepared a plan on what i'm going to do in the next 12 weeks and what are the milestones along the way and what are the risks or uncertainties around that and just putting that out in the very first week of the assignment really helped uh the, this and they created that problem for everyone so obviously as we progress in that journey the plan deviated a bit from that plan on a page but that really helped in the first instance and the second instance was uh, we we were enabled to do uh, operationalize it in the sense that we had a, a server instance in our data center where we could deploy models so that was really helpful as well so um, and the last bit was actually being guided by the uh, business team so i was working in a side analytics team working for the complaints analytics team so complaints analytics team was my stakeholder at that point i later moved into complaints analytics team so um so what i did was i was really guided by the complaints analytics team stakeholders at that point in time for example we were in sure of there were about five to six models we could operationalize it and uh, we didn't go with the most fancy model we went with the use case that was the most business impact so there was one use case that had the, the most business impact and we prioritized that over the others and quickly operationalized that and another thing that really helped was in the uat phase we let the manual analyst team do the uh, classifications we let the model run it and then we compared we also did error analysis for those um, use cases and that really helped with the buying along with model interpretability so i would say those were uh, those were the key uh, aspects looking back that really helped in that um, in that journey I, i should say that there were there were really good executive support so there was nothing additional that need to be done on that front and that was really awesome as well i love it that is that is outstanding and how when you're looking at the different models and different approaches how did you measure the business impact in order to decide to go with the one that had the most business impact so there was one model where that uh, i guess this one this particular one was a little bit of um, it separates to the other categorization problems where there were the analysts were finding that even with the the, the level of detail that was there in the complaint text there is not much they could do with the categorization they were actually marking things in unknown so it mm-hmm. did uh, make sense to figure out those unknowns up front um, and flag that it's unknown so which was different to all the other categorizations that we were doing so it was really driven by optimization at that point but later as we went on to productionizing and implementing into the new system it was more um, driven by what is the business benefit and feasibility for each of the categorization and the business benefits were really really captured as for the other models it was captured as the amount of automation that would free up the classification um, effort yeah that's really good <clears throat> that's interesting to go with the yeah to um to go with the the areas that are tougher or or unknown like yeah the the unknown to go with the tougher ones that's that's really interesting um that's a good way to to do it yeah so in the sense that analysts were not it was actually quite easy in the sense that analysts were not able to categorize because there was not sufficient information in the complaint data so um, quite often it was easy I, and i think um, it also had the additional one of we were trying like we could infer the data quality of the input mm. complaints as well from those um but if we had to pay special attention to the kind of language that um our friend and staff was using because that was critical to understanding what the complaint text was all about that's great ah oh, that's great that's such a such a good way and and um maybe last question on 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 this 
um, how did you operationalize the, the models? What, what did that look like? So the, the first one was proof of concept, but as I said, it was deployed as um, on a Windows server as a Python program. But the second one, which is the actual production system that is live now, is we've got our model environment um, in AWS. We uh, write Python programs and structure it um, uh, via an API endpoint. So if there's an API endpoint that invokes the, the Python series of Python code and it returns back the results in a JSON format, it would say for each category, each question, and this is the response, this is the particular categorization, and this is the uncertainty measure. So it's a huge JSON string that actually sends back into the front end system. In my, in my operationalizing aspect of that machine learning models, I also worked really close on rolling out the front end system and translating the data science requirements into the front end system. So I drove the, the integration points of the system into the data science, the requirements around that, um, and worked really close with the front end team to make sure our requirements are actually well captured. So requirements around being able to configure an uncertainty threshold in the front end system being able to, and then um, doing something with that uncertainty threshold in the workflow in the finance system, and being able to configure a proportion of complaints to hold out from the classification workflow and giving the business the ability to change that. Because one of the realities of working in operation teams is you will have unintended resource crunches. And in the ideal state, you may want to hold out 10%, but it may not be possible because of resource crunch. And in that case, we need to give the business team the ability to um, to alter that, and that is ultimately something that the business team can um, can actually alter and maintain. And yeah, they they have the permission to actually do that, and the I guess the roles and uh, account level permissions to do that. That's great. Yeah, I love the the amount of um, well business engagement definitely, but also business control. How much how much insight they had into the process um, between labeling data, setting thresholds, and, and uh, looking at um, the, the feedback and sort of relabeling or, or even auditing, uh, that is really great engagement. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say it's like a human in the loop uh, AI. That's, that's the term typically that's been used where we actually get that feedback from the manual uh, process to then improve the, uh, the automated process. Yeah, no, it's really good. I also love the, the amount of time that you spent focusing on the data and on improving data, capturing the right data, having um, high quality data for, for the project. Um, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. It also helped that, there's, there's, I guess, for the broader team, there are strict data quality measure objectives. So, um, like the team has got a, got a peer reviewed process. So they've got, so they are, there is a process where a sample of complaints get picked up from them in the manual classification workflow and somebody peer reviews those categorization and training happens to those teams from those categorizations. So the data quality gets uplifted and there are measures around data quality at the team level targets as well. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. And then also focusing on, um, specific areas that have higher impact um, in this case categorizing the unknowns um great 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 no thank you thank you so much um so i thought maybe we can we can change tack and uh, change tack and discuss um either um your current role and your um any anything around your current remit or uh we could go into um some advice that you would have for people either getting into data science, data science or, or looking to advance their career, um, which which one of those would you want to jump in? So we can go into current role and uh, around learning and development, and then I can actually go into um, some of the advice as well, because Perfect. learning and development really ties in with actually for anyone who's actually looking to move into data science. Okay, let's do that. So uh, when it comes to the current role, I'll start with giving a bit of background on the company I work for. The most listeners would have experienced their farmers through retail brands such as Kmart, Target, Officeworks, Barnings, and Priceline, as well as online presence through cats.com.au and geeks to you. The West Farmers One Digital, where I belong, is a digital enabling unit for the divisions. Within One Digital, we have One Pass, our subscription program. 
uh, catch.com.au, our marketplace, and one data, our shared data asset. Our revamped subscription program is launched across Kmart, Target, Catch, and Bunnings, where customers pay $4 a month to access free delivery across participating divisions. So for listeners who are looking to get their Christmas shopping in order, it's a great value proposition across some of your favorite brands. Mm. In fact, public launch of One Pass with Bunnings was just yesterday. So the news is hot off the press. Awesome. One, one Data, uh, formerly known as the Advanced Analytics Center, manages the best farmers shared data assets. We are working towards enabling the divisions to form a more compelling offer to customers. So we are guided by rigorous consent framework and strong protection of consumer data. Our quarterly planning typically sets my priorities. So during my time, I have worked on data products using graph-based algorithms. Currently, I'm leading one of the cross-functional squads composed of machine learning, platform engineers, um, data analysts, and data scientists. So I work very closely with the data, uh, with the product manager in defining the roadmap of data science products. So that's pretty much how my day to day looks. But I'll move on to learning and development before uh, tackling the question on uh, data science and advice for people who actually uh, want to move into data science. So one of the key things that attracted me to the role was the focus on learning and development. So there are three activities embedded into our day to day that foster a culture of curiosity. So the first is we get to spend 10% of our time on research activities or on learning and development. So across the data science team. 10%, that's amazing. I know, I know, yes. Uh, I was blown away by it. And I was even more um, happy about how it's actually embedded into the operating rhythm of the team. So across the data science team, we spend Thursday afternoons solving a research problem with a business lens or on learning and development. So my research problem, just to give a flavor, is multimodal product classification. So how to predict the category of a product from product description and product images. Given the fast moving nature of retail catalog and need for us as a division to form a unified view across all our division's products, there is business significance for this research project. We also have a fortnightly quick check-ins to discuss the progress on research project or on learning and development that really helps us to learn from each other. So that is how it's actually embedded into our um, day-to-day. And that, that's why I think it is more real for us. And the second part is our community of practice that runs across all divisions across West Farmers. So we have data science community of practice, another one for data analysts, and a third one for data engineers. The community of practice typically holds bi-monthly or quarterly meetings. We do get to hear from the division's use cases. I, we get to share our use cases. And we even um, invite external speakers into community of practice. And the last one, and my favorite, is I host a weekly discussion forum where we discuss research papers, share technical knowledge, or brainstorm ideas. So Friday fun sessions, as I would like to brand them, uh, revolves around three main things, technical topics, brainstorming, or paper reading. So first theme is technical topic. An example of the tech topic would be machine learning engineers share a detail or a nuance around the new machine learning platform. The second theme is brainstorming. And the brainstorming topics can be quite broad from model really technical ones on model monitoring to what are the changes we could actually make to the internal process. The third thing is paper reading. So we have so much positive feedback on paper reading mm. that Friday fun sessions have pivoted towards paper reading these days. So paper reading sessions have a butterfly effect. So a minor change in team's understanding of the underlying mechanics can significantly impact the modeling outcomes. So I'll bring it to life um, by talking through an example of uh, attention is all you need paper. So that's the very famous transformer paper, which we read a few months ago. After exploring the paper thoroughly, a colleague of mine wondered 
if we could tackle the product categorization, the unified product categorization use case as a sequence to sequence model. So he was able to experiment that at his research time, and that led to uplift in some categories. For another colleague of mine, it sparked an idea on applying a tweak to a previously discarded experiment. And this then led to that particular experiment with the tweak being the best model for that use case. So lastly, as a team, we were able to build a working prototype in a four-hour hackathon using semantic search and the understanding from that paper rating session, as well as some focused team effort, helped us to get across the line in that hackathon. So that's some of the examples on how um, paper rating sessions help, because it can sound very nerdy when I say paper rating, but it does have tangible impacts. So paper rating is also a gift that keeps on giving. So every paper rating session leads to more papers that we want to reference and read. And one of my learning philosophies is you learn so much more when you try to share your knowledge or teach others. And through these avenues, we can nurture a culture of curiosity. I'll come back to your question on you know, advice on somebody who's actually trying to move into data science. In my previous roles as well, I have led the learning and development activities. Like some of the learning and development activities I have read, led was you know, doing Python training for the beginners and maths for data science study groups. But through these, I've had many conversations around the same question, which is like, how can I, I'm so interested in moving into data science, how can I get started? And my response is same um, as to those questions as well. The first one is that it is great that you know that you want to move into data science because many people actually don't know or don't have that level of discernment. So it's it's great and it's a problem that is kind of half solved. But there is a second part to it, which is one of my favorite saying is vision without action is merely a dream. So um, like if you have got the vision of moving into data science and there is not enough action, that can remain a dream. And uh, unfortunately, that does happen quite a bit because um, I've had many conversations where I see over the years where uh, people kind of get bogged down by the day to day. And I, I, that's quite understandable. I'm not saying that that, that is not, it's not always the right answer for everyone, but that's something to keep in mind as well. And lastly, uh, it's around the action. So I think around the action that is to really understand what is the foundation that you're standing on now. So maybe you've got background in data engineering. Maybe you've got background in data analysis. Maybe you've got background in maths already, but you just want to uh, upskill on the programming part. It's to really understand what is the foundation that you're standing on. Mm. Understand where you, like what is the skills that are required for the, for the new um, role. And for that, doing introductory courses really helps you to understand where you are in, in this whole landscape and taking on stretch activities, program assignments, project assignments, and courses and, and books to actually fill that gap. It's a, it's a long journey. And depending on the individual circumstances, that journey will vary a lot uh, for, from people to people. But it's to take that journey and constantly learn and develop to, to bridge the gap. So that's essentially what it is. And one of the things you'll realize is as you learn more, you will, you will know more of the things you don't know. And then you'll have to learn. So that, that's, it's a continuous cycle. I love it. I love it. That is that is fantastic. And and where where does the um the passion and the drive for learning and development come from for you? And to to help provide it some structure and um you know get get some momentum behind such important initiatives. I think it's through it's knowing that when I try to share the knowledge, that just gives me that extra momentum or extra push to really stick through the plan. Otherwise, it can fall through. Um, and that is probably one of one of the philosophies. And um, the other one is probably around building systems around your learning and development journey. So whatever it is, having a journal for what you're learning or capturing notes. It's a really old school basic systems, but something that really helps with the recollection of the facts. Yeah, that's excellent. And that is so good. Um, I just, um, I think, I think that is a fantastic note to end on. I just realized that the time, the time is is flying. But I want to thank you so much 
for sharing uh, your knowledge, your journey, your perspectives, um, your your, the, your motivation and, and the initiatives, uh, the insights of the, the work that you've done. Um, it, it's been so valuable uh, to get your learnings out to the community. So thank you so much for your time and for sharing everything that you have with us. Thank you so much, Philip. It was really a pleasure to have this conversation. Thanks for watching this video all the way to the end. I hope that you got a lot out of this discussion. And if you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe to the channel um, so more people can find out about the challenges that leaders have in the analytics and AI space. And that's what we're trying to share in Data Futurology. Uh, so please like and subscribe. And if you enjoyed today's episode, uh, please tell your friends. Thank you so much.